Well, we are going to dive in to another big question here. You know that we started this conviction series, and I'll tell you right now, just off the bat, when I started this, I thought it would be a good idea because these are big topics that we must talk about as Christians. These are topics that we really need to wrestle with. And sometimes we take for granted that we, we think we know these topics, and sometimes we really don't. And we find out when maybe uh, someone from a, a different Christian sect will come knocking on our door and they'll start challenging us on some of these topics. And if we don't have the right answers, uh, well, at, at worst, we are left without a good Christian witness. And at worst, I'm sorry, at best, we're left without a good Christian witness. And at worst, we could end up confused about some things ourselves. So I thought we need to talk about these things. Now, what I didn't think about is was how much work this is going to be on Pastor Robert to get this right. Um, so it's, it's a blessing uh, to be able to share these. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that I come up here with is a lot of fear and trembling. Last time I spoke to you, I spoke to you about who is God? Who is God? A major big question that I have to, that you have to, that we have to get right. Today is another big question. Who is Jesus? And many, many of you are probably thinking, well, I know who Jesus is. I'm a Christian. I've always known who Jesus is. I, I watched the movie. And uh, you might have an idea about who Jesus is. I, I'm, I'm sure you probably have an idea of who Jesus is. But who is Jesus really? What is he really like? Who is he? I'll tell you what, the question of who is Jesus is such a difficult question that sometimes even pastors and teachers get it wrong. Just this week, uh, I decided to go online and to just watch some maybe different preachers. Like, what do they say about this question? Who is Jesus? And I turned on uh, this famous pastor, by the way, famous pastor, uh, and huge church. And the question that he was answering was the question of, who is Jesus? And within the first five minutes, maybe even less than that, he already had given out heretical information on who Jesus was. Like it was, and it was a, a mega church, famous. People know who this church is all over the country. And almost immediately, he answered things about Jesus that were not accurate. I'm not saying he's a heretic. I'm just saying he needed to do a little more homework on who is Jesus. Now, I will tell you that this is a difficult question to answer fully. And if you think I can answer it completely in one sermon, you're wrong. And if you think that I divided it into two sermons, you're also wrong. <laughs> We're going to go for it, all of it, today. Let me tell you the first thing you need to know about Jesus. The very first thing that people will tell you about Jesus, and it's on the negative side, I'm going to tell you who Jesus is not, first and foremost. Jesus is not a myth. I'll say that again, because people will say that Jesus is a myth. Jesus is not a myth. And you'll say, well, you're a Christian. I expect that you would say that. Well, it's not just me that says that Jesus is not a myth. But in order to really find out whether something is actual, especially something from ancient history, to find out if it's true or not, what do you have to go to? Well, you have to go to, first and foremost, ancient historians, people that have spoken about this in their own writings, and preferably people that don't have a Christian bias. The very first person, you've heard this name throughout this series before, and I hope that by the end of the series, you're more familiar with this name. You should know this name as a believer, Flavius Josephus. Uh, Flavius Josephus, he was a Roman Jewish historian, and he had no business, no care to write about Christianity. His interest is to write about Roman and Jewish history. 
But what happens? Jesus is intertwined in Roman and Jewish history. So without wanting to speak about Jesus, if he's going to be an accurate, a good, and faithful historian, if he's going to be accurate about it, then he needs to speak about this man named Jesus. And it turns out that as he's given the history, as he's bringing it out there uh, to his Roman Jewish audience, he speaks on Jesus. What does he say about Jesus? Well, he says that Jesus was a, a, a mighty worker, a worker of good deeds. It's one of the things that he says, that he was a teacher and he was a worker of good deeds, someone that people recognize as a teacher. He also mentions Jesus in his uh, Antiquities of the Jews. He also mentions James, which is the brother of Jesus. Now, these are not central to his focus. These are incidentals. He's not intending to prove Jesus, but he is speaking of Jesus. So we have a Jewish Roman historian that is speaking of Jesus, and we can say, well, that is evidence that Jesus was an actual person. Why would a Roman Jewish historian speak of a fictional mythical person? Why would they do that? They wouldn't. He is speaking truth about Jesus. He's not the only one. There's also Cornelius Tacitus. And in his writings, he mentions Jesus as well. And he mentions Christians as well. He's doing it in the context of talking about the founder of Christianity, which is Christ. He mentions Jesus. Third one I have for you is Lucian of Samosata. And he also mentions Jesus. Now, he mentions Jesus in a satire type of way. He, he mentions Jesus as he's mocking Christians because he says, look at these fools. Look at these Christians. Look at these people that are following someone that was crucified. Lucian of Samosata also talks about Jesus without wanting to talk about Jesus. Actually, while he's mocking Jesus and while he's mocking Christians. But this is so neat because for us today, we have these writings. And for us today, we can say, wait a second, these are people that spoke about Jesus. Well, you might say, yeah, but that's ancient history. How do I know that? Well, we can go to some modern day scholars and historians, one of them, which is an agnostic and possibly even an atheist, Bart Ehrman, very critical of the Christian faith. But this is what he writes concerning mythicists, people that believe that Jesus is a mythical character. He says, I do not discuss mythicists in the class. Since, as I have repeatedly indicated, the mythicist view does not have a foothold or even a toehold among modern critical scholars of the Bible. This is an agnostic. Someone that says, I don't know whether God exists or not. This is someone that probably is an atheist. And someone that debates, by the way, many Christians, and even he says, no, Jesus is not a mythical character. He's an actual person. You can go to another agnostic, Maurice Casey. I therefore conclude, he writes, that the mythicist argument are completely spurious from beginning to end. They have been mainly put forward by incompetent and unqualified people. So here you have two modern-day scholars, historians, that are also saying Jesus was an actual person. The last one I've got for you is R. Joseph Hoffman. And he writes, he says, the disease, speaking of uh, mythicist, the disease of these buggers spread is ignorance disguised as common sense. They are the single greatest threat next to the fundamentalism, uh, to the calm and considered academic study of religion, touting the scientific methods as their mod op while ignoring its application to historical study. Jesus is not 
a mythical character, but rather there is indeed a historical Jesus. How do we know? We know because of the ancient writings, people that have written about Jesus. And how do we know today? Because scholars even today will tell you that Jesus was an actual person that walked the earth. For you, what do you need to know? Some of you say, well, I already knew Jesus was real. Why, why did I need that? No, you need to let people know that ancient writers have written about Jesus and modern day scholars still believe that Jesus was a real person. Okay, we got that one out of the way. Jesus is not a mythical character. But who is he? And who did he say he was? Well, Jesus is actually fully God. The last time we spoke, we spoke about the Trinity. And we spoke about that, uh, that it is three persons, one being. Jesus is the, the second person of the Trinity. And in being the second person of the Trinity, he is fully God. He is fully God. We read in Colossians 2.9, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. All the fullness, all of, all of God is in Jesus Christ. Jesus is fully God. In Philippians, uh, a very popular verse, we read uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 7. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who what? Who being in very nature God. That's an important word. Being in, uh, in, in nature, he was God. His nature was that he was God. He did not consider equality with God, equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the what? Very nature, a very important word. So he, by nature, was God. But then he takes on the very nature he takes on a, a new nature. He doesn't, watch this, he doesn't replace his nature. He doesn't stop being God so that he can be man. But rather, he takes on a new nature, the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Being God, he takes on a new nature. Now, some people will tell you, that God morphed into Jesus, and then Jesus morphed into the Holy Spirit. And I will tell you, that is inaccurate. That is actually heretical. That is not what the Bible teaches about the Trinity. Uh, you need to know that the Bible, what, what the Bible teaches about the Trinity, uh, it's difficult to understand. I get it. But it is that we serve one God. We are a monotheistic faith. One God Three persons, Jesus is the second person, and he is fully God. And we'll talk about this in a little bit because he was also fully man. He had to be fully man. Now, what did Jesus think about himself? Some people of some faiths will tell you that Jesus never said, I am God. Muslims will tell you that. Jehovah Witnesses will tell you that. Uh, Mormons uh, may tell you that, uh, but people will tell you that Jesus never said, I am God. I am God. Now, they're right in a sense. He never said the words, I am God. And if, if that's the criteria, they're right. I am God. He, he, did he phrase it that way ever? I am God. No, he did not. But if that's a criteria, neither did he ever say, I am not God. Nevertheless, he does believe himself to be God and even says that he is God. In John chapter 8, this is really important stuff here because other people will tell you that Jesus never said this, that Jesus is not God. In John chapter 8, the Jews are accusing Jesus of being demon-possessed. They're saying, you are demon-possessed. And this is what Jesus answers them. He says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. 
Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. He is referring to God the Father. He's saying, God the Father seeks my glory. By the way, in Isaiah, the Bible tells us that God shares his glory with no one. In order for God to share his glory, he would only have to share it with God. But yet, God, he is saying, the Father seeks to glorify me, the Son. Now, watch this, verse 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, they're accusing Jesus, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. And then they ask him some really important questions here. He says, are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? And then this is the question we really want to get to. This is the question that answers, who are you? Who do you think you are? Who does, it's, it's one thing for the authors of the New Testament to say who Jesus was. It's a totally different thing for Jesus to tell you who he is. This is what he says, who do you make yourself out to be? The Jews, they corner Jesus. And they say, who do you say you are? Who do you make yourself out to be? His answer is in verse 58. This is what he says. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And some of you might look at that and say, wait, what, 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 what do you mean? What do you mean? Some of you got it right away. Some other people might think this is improper grammar. Like, does Jesus even know how to speak English? Like, you know, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, what you need to know is that I am was the name that God gave Moses about himself. When Moses asked, who are you? Who should I say sent me? Who should I say sent me? And we read this in Exodus 3. God said to Moses, I am what I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. So every time someone came back to Moses, who sent you? Moses would constantly have to say, I am sent me. So in a Jewish mindset, when they hear the words, I am, this is different. You don't just say, I am, and get away with it. You don't just say that. You are saying that you are God by stating that you are the I am, that you are eternal. Not only that, he says, before Abraham, before, if you will, the founder of our faith, before the founder of our nation, before even Abraham, even before your father, I was already there. Jesus is claiming eternality. He's saying, I've, I've always been. I am. I, I was then, I am today, and I will forever be. I am. He's making himself equal with God. Just to prove the point, watch what happens as the Jews hear what Jesus just said. This is what happens. So they picked up stones to throw at him. Why did they pick up stones to throw at Jesus? They picked up stones to throw at Jesus because in their minds, he was a blasphemer. He had just equated himself to God. Let's put it in, in our context today. Imagine I stood up here today, and I allowed people to worship me. I allowed people to say, uh, call me Lord. Uh, and imagine if I came back to you and say, by the way, just want to let you know that I am God, like me, Rob. If I said that, there's no rocks here. But I'm sure some chairs or something will fly. You know, I, I could not say that. Uh, I could not say that. Uh, you should, if I ever said anything that crazy, you should, first of all, fire me. That's the first thing. Uh, you should get rid of me, 
faster than, I don't know, whatever you get rid of fast. Like, you should get rid of me right away. And if you allow me to continue to stay in this position, you should run very far from this place. No one just says that they are God and gets away with it. Of course, in some cults, people have done such a thing, and and that's why they're cults. Jesus here is saying, I am. They pick up stones. They're going to throw it at him. You read two chapters later in John, and then you get this where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Jesus just doesn't get it. Like, you know, like, dude, you ticked off these Jews. Like, you need to stop it. I I love what C.S. Lewis said about Jesus. C.S. Lewis says that Jesus is, is, he's either Lord right? He's either who he says he is, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. Uh, People, he, he says, people will tell you that Jesus is a good teacher, but is a good teacher a liar? If, if a good teacher is a liar, then obviously they're not a good teacher because in order to meet the criteria of being a good teacher, you got to teach things that are accurate, things that are truthful, so you can't, he can't be a liar and a good teacher at the same time. Now, he says maybe Jesus was self-deceived. Maybe Jesus was not a liar, but maybe he had lied to himself. And maybe he was a lunatic. Maybe he was just a crazy man going around telling people, I am God, I am God. Maybe he was just nuts. Like Maybe that's the, the, what was wrong with Jesus. But what's the problem with that? Well, you hear the wisdom that he shared. Everybody talked about the wisdom that Jesus spoke with. Everyone, even to this day, people that are not Christians will say that Jesus had great teachings. He says, well, how could a good teacher be crazy? That you can't, you can't have it that way. So if he's not a liar, and if he's not a lunatic, then he must be Lord. He must be who he says he is. The Jews, again, when he says that he and the Father are one, the Jews, again, pick up stones against him. They're ready to stone him. Jesus, he says, uh, listen, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? I love the way Jesus plays with them. Like, he's so funny. He says, you see me do a lot of good things. Why are you stoning me? Like, why, why are we doing this? Like, why? He knows the right answer, but he's playing the fool here. He's playing like he doesn't know why they're stoning him. He's playing like, oh, which good work, which good thing that I do that you're about to crucify me? Kind of like my kids say, is it illegal? Is it illegal? Is it illegal to do a good work? Is there something wrong with that? That's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, what, what is it that you're going to uh, stone me for? This is what the Jews answered Jesus. The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy. For blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. The Jews understood very well. What Jesus was saying when he said before Abraham was, I am. They said, oh, no, 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 not today. Not today. And they were ready to get rid of Jesus because Jesus himself proclaimed that he was God. But how do we know that he's really God? I mean, people say weird things, right? How do I know? Show me the credentials. Well, in the book of John, and John does a really good job at outlining this very fact that Jesus is fully God. This is, this is what, he's, what we have in the book of John. We have seven I am statements, and we also have seven miracles in the book of John. Here are the I am statements. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And when he says, I am the bread of life, what does this bring back to memory for a Jewish mind? The fact that they cried out to God and he provided manna for them. 
uh, he's basically saying, I am your God, your provider. I am everything you need. That, isn't that beautiful? Like, I am the bread of life. Then he says, I am the light of the world. In the beginning, there was no light. And God said, let there be light. He goes, I am the one that can shine in the midst of darkness. I am the light of the world. He says, I am the door. I'm the only way that you come to God. I am the only way to salvation. I'm not just one way. I am the way. I am the door. He says, I am the good shepherd. Oh, that's beautiful. He's saying, I am the one who cares for you. I am the one who, who, who is there when, when there's no one else around. I am the one there when you're in trouble and the one that, 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 that dries your tears. I am the one that cares for you. I am the good shepherd. He also says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. You, as a believer, have no fear of death. You trust that you will be resurrected. You trust that our life is fully found in Jesus. Then he says, again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to God other than through Jesus. And finally says, I am the true vine. What does he mean by I am the true vine? I am the source. I am the source. The, these are his I am statements in the book of John. John gives us seven miracles in his book as well. And every one of these miracles uh, means something. But for time's sake and for brevity, I'm not going to go into detail. But I'll show you what the seven miracles are. Number one, uh, Jesus turns water into wine. And that's his first miracle. He actually changes a substance from one to a completely different substance. He heals an official son. He heals an invalid at the pool of Bethesda. He feeds 5,000 people with five loaves. Um, he walks on water. He heals a blind man in Jerusalem. And he raises, finally, Lazarus from the dead. This is like amazing stuff. This is Jesus not just telling you that he is God, but showing you that he is God. It's one thing to, to get the word right. It's a different thing to get the works right. And Jesus had both the word and the works. It was all there. How do I know that he's God? Because he put his money where his mouth was. Because he did what he said he could do. And he fulfilled it. That's how we know that he is God. John, as he's closing the book, he writes this about Jesus' miracles. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. John tells you, I am writing these miracles down so that you know that Jesus is the Christ. John, by the way, that's writing this is John the Beloved that was right there close to Jesus. You know, sometimes the people that know you best are the people that are closest to you. They know the good, the bad, and the ugly. They know what you look like when, when your hair is messed up. Like they, they know when you don't have the makeup on. They've seen you. John was one of the close ones there with Jesus. And he is trying to prove to us, this is God. This is God. Not only was he fully God, but he was also fully man. Now, this is important here. Uh, he's not a God that became a man or a man that became a God. That's, that's important. He's a God that took on the very nature of a man. He never stopped being God. 
He just came to this earth, and while he was on this earth, he had the limitations of, of being a human being. And, and listen, how that actually happened, I don't know. It's called the incarnation of Christ, how he became a man. He, he became a man. He, he felt like you felt. He knows what you feel. He, he, he just like you, um, he got hungry like you got hungry. Uh, he, he cried like you cry. Everything that is true to the human experience was true for him, except for one thing. He was without sin. Now, it, it's hard to, for us to really wrap our heads around this, but, but, but I want you to know that, uh, think about who Adam was before the fall. Think about what Adam must have been like and his relationship to God before the fall, before sin entered the world. That is what Jesus' nature, human nature, was like. That clean slate, if you will. Absolutely clean. That is why it's important that he was born of a virgin. Because he did not, he did not come from the seed, the sinful seed of man. But rather, Jesus was fully man, fully God. And his humanity is something that we must also take seriously because if we don't take it seriously, then we think that we don't have a God that understands us. But Hebrews tells us that we do have a God that sympathizes with us, that understands what it's like to be a human, that that understands the the pain and and understands what it's like to be limited, uh, understands that. He he was uh, in human nature, and that's, that's important for us to know. That you have a God that that understands you. He was tempted in every way and yet was without sin. In the same ways that you're tempted, Jesus was tempted. The same things that you go through, Jesus went through. The same way that you want to take control of situations and can't as a human, Jesus had limitations. Hebrews 2.9 says this, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and with honor because he suffered death. He, the only reason he had to become a man, or not, not the only reason, but one of the reasons he had to become a man was because he wouldn't be able to die unless he was a man. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus was able to taste death because he was a man. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 says, For this reason he had had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And for that, uh, and that he might make atonement for the sins of people because he himself suffered when he was tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted when you are being tempted you know that you can call on Jesus because he he understands you in fact as I was studying for this and thinking about this I said you know when we're tempted wouldn't it be just best to start praying like in that moment and like call on to Jesus I wonder how many temptations we'd be able to uh, not be tempted by if we called on Jesus. If we, if we literally got down on our knees and said, Lord Jesus, I know you understand what this feels like right now. You understand this temptation. I know you understand this temptation. I, I know you feel, uh, you felt like I feel right now. Lord Jesus, can you help me? Because I know you understand me. I wonder how that would work out for us. I wonder if we'd be able to, to, you know, not be tempted, not fall into temptation simply because we called on the name of Jesus in that moment. Try it next time. Next time you're on 287, go ahead and try it. Next time you're driving on 22, Lord Jesus, if you don't help me now, God, try it. Try it when, when your husband gets a little weird, right? Or, or your wife, not, not that I've ever been there. But try it. Call on Jesus. Lord Jesus, I know you, you've been tempted. I know you've been here before. How did you do it? 
how did you do it? And cry out to him. Man, I wonder, come back and tell me how to go, right? <laughs> I won't even say what I just thought, but anyway, we'll, we'll just go further. <laughs> I say this <laughs> because many deceivers, uh, why, why do we need to get this right about Jesus' humanity? Why do we need to get it right? This is what John writes. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. And then he goes on in verse 11. He says, anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. Jesus was fully God. He was fully man. Now, this is, by the way, I'm going to, fill you in on a little secret. This is what I heard the preacher that I spoke about say. The preacher, uh, and I can't quote him, I, I should have maybe, but what he basically said, he said that Jesus is no longer a man. He said Jesus is no longer a man. And some of you might think, well, well, yeah, he ascended to heaven. Is he still a man? Great question. Come back next week. I'm teasing. No. Is Jesus still a man? It turns out that he is. He's the God man. He's still fully God and fully man. You remember when he came back and he presented himself to the apostles, right? And the disciples, he came back and he presented. He said, look at the scars. Of course, he had a glorified body. It was different because now he's doing crazy stuff. Like he's walking through walls and stuff. Like, like this is a completely different body. But nevertheless, he came back. He was still a man. When he rose from the grave, he was still a man. And when he ascended to heaven, he was still a man. The Bible never says that he stopped being a man and that he morphed back into God. That is not accurate. That is not true. Fully God, fully man. This is what the angels said when Jesus was ascending to heaven. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way. How is he coming? He is coming as the God man. The same way that he went up is the same way he's coming back. As you saw him go into heaven, the same way you saw him ascend into heaven as the God man, he's also coming back as the God man. He didn't take off his human nature he simply put on a human nature. But this is the most beautiful thing you need to know about Jesus. Is that Jesus is a savior. He's a savior. It took God coming to earth to become a man, to feel what you and I feel, to go through what you and I go through to hurt, to, to feel uh, the way we feel. It took God to do that, to come and die in your place, to come and die in my place. Romans 6.23, and we're going to just land here and probably stay here for a little bit. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. What is a wage? A wage is what you get paid, right? At the end of the year, you see your, uh, what is it, your W-2, and uh, you see these are the wages. And maybe that's when you start crying. <laughs> this is what you earned all year. And you're like, oh, <laughs> do you even care about me, God? Those are the wages. You get paid for work that you do. You do some work, you get paid for it. Those are your wages. The wages of sin, what you get paid for sin, you got to get this, what you get paid for sin is death. If you've sinned, according to the Bible, 
And by the way, the Bible also says we've all sinned. And we've all fallen short from the glory of God. So what do we pay? Or what do we get paid? What's our reward for sin? Death. Death. Sin don't sound so much fun anymore, does it? You mean what? Those two minutes worth of fun? Death? Eternal condemnation? Like, really, is it worth it? And it's, by the way, it's not just physical death, although some sins can take you to physical death. But, but I'm talking eternal death, complete separation from God. Uh, that is what death really means here, complete and utter separation from God. The wages of sin is death. But one of the words that you should come to love in Scripture is the word but. The wages of sin is death, but. Anytime you hear that but, you know, you know something good is coming on that other side. If there's something bad on this side, you know there's something really good coming on the other side. He says the wages of sin is death, but the gift, what's a gift? What's a gift? It's different than a wage, isn't it? What's a gift? A gift is something that someone gives you that you did not necessarily deserve or merit. Like it, it was just a gift. It was out of nowhere. Someone just gave it to you out of the kindness of their heart. It, it's like a little bonus thing that you weren't even expecting. You didn't have to work. And if you have to work for your gifts, then they are not gifts. But you don't have to work for an actual gift. You don't have to work for that. A gift is just that. It's just the gift. It, it's, a, it's a surprise. It's like, I wasn't expecting this. Why weren't you expecting it? Because I didn't necessarily do anything for it. But it's Mother's Day. I know, but I'm supposed to be a mom. Or, or it's Father's Day <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Um, <sighs> very subtle, right? Uh, but it's Father's Day. Yeah, but I'm supposed to be a father. I'm supposed to do it with or without a gift. Like, it, it doesn't make a difference. Size is 16. And, no, I'm teasing. A gift is something you just receive. You didn't have to work for it. It's just, it's yours for no reason, no good reason. He says the gift of God. <laughs> oh, man, wait a minute, wait a minute. When God gives stuff, it's good. Did you have, like me, that aunt that her gifts were the ones you really wanted to dig into? Like the one that she sent, like, good, I'm glad you got my card, but let me open Titi's card. <laughs> like, let me get this card opened up because that's the good gift. You know, you have a God that gives good gifts. You have a God that knows what you really need and, and knows how to give it. He says, but the gift of God, what God has given you for doing absolutely nothing, is eternal life. Eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, I expected Holy Ghost right there. I expected Holy Ghost, the gift of God. This is what Jesus came to do. This was his mission. He came to save you and I. And that's why he is a savior. But be because before Jesus, what we faced was God's wrath. We talked about that. We talked about the fact that God's wrath is not something that God intends to be wrathful or wants to be wrathful, but, but God's wrath is just the, the, the product of his holiness because he is such a holy God, he cannot tolerate sin in his midst. So he must be avenge, avenge himself of wrath, and, and I'm sorry, of sin. He must get rid of sin, and that is his wrath. The gift of God is eternal life. What does God do so he doesn't have to have wrath on us? He provides Jesus on the cross to die for us. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
What do I need to be saved? Do I need to give a certain amount of money to be saved? No. What do I need to be saved? Do I have to sacrifice something? Um, Really, no. What do I need to be saved? Do I need to go to church seven days a week? Um, You know, no. Do, Do I even have to go once a week? No. What do I need to do to be saved? Well, really nothing. Really nothing. All you have to do is accept the gift of salvation. Like, it's like here, and all you do is either you take it or you don't. Either you take it and receive it, or you reject it. I don't, I don't want this thing. How do you receive it? He says you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord of your life. Now, if he's Lord of your life, if he is Lord of your life, then there is a change in life. But not because you make the changes so that God receives you. Rather, you make the changes because you have said, He is Lord of my life. Do do you see the difference there? It's not that I have to do X, Y, Z so that God loves me, so that I'm saved. No, it's because I'm saved and because He's my Lord. Now I go to church, now I give. Now I do what God wants me to do. Now I read my Bible. Now I want a relationship with Jesus. But it's because I'm saved, not to be saved. I don't buy my wife flowers so that she would marry me. She's already married me. Now I buy her flowers so that she knows I love her. What do you do? You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and then you will be saved. How difficult is that? How hard is that? Well, for some people, it's very difficult. For some people, they just don't want to, they, they, they don't want Jesus to be Lord. They're happy being Lord themselves. I'm fine. I don't need a Lord. Already have a Lord. Thank you. I am my Lord. No. Jesus says if you need to be, if you want to be saved, just confess Jesus is Lord. It was his sacrifice on the cross that rescues us and saves us from us having to pay our own penalty. So here's my question to you. Do you actually know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? As I was thinking about this message today, I, I, didn't, I didn't want this to be a message filled with just facts and numbers, but rather I was praying and talking to God about it, and I said, Lord, I, I don't just, I don't want to just prove things. But I want people to know that there is a real Jesus that actually wants relationship with us. That there is a a God, think about it, a God that wants relationship with you, that wants relationship with me. And as I'm praying and talking to God and thinking about that, God puts a memory back here. And it's it's a memory of when I was in fifth grade. When I was in fifth grade, I had a really cool friend. Um, he was so cool that I forgot his name now, but he was really cool. Um, I want to say his name was Jason, but I don't think that's right. So I'll call him Jason just for the sermon, but uh, he was really cool. He had blonde hair, spiky, full hair, like really cool kid. He was like the coolest kid in the class. I was surprised that he was my friend, but he was really cool. And um, I really enjoyed being around him. I, I wanted to have my hair like him. Now I just want to have hair. Um, but he, he was a, a really cool kid. I really wanted to be around him. So he was so cool that one day 
he steps up. We, we have like this little crowd in the class, and we're like all like sitting in a circle. And um, the cutest girl in the class is there. And she's in the circle. And my friend, the coolest kid, um, he likes this girl. I mean, who doesn't? She was a beautiful girl. And she was also supposed to be in sixth grade, but got left back. Um, so this, you know, we, we're here with this older woman, right? And, uh, and we're all kind of sitting around. And my friend wants to let this girl know that he likes her. And this is, this is how you know he's cool. Because he decides to do this in front of everybody. That's how cool he was. So he tells this girl, he says, um, her name was Zeta, by the way. How cool is that name, right? Like just the name is Zeta. Like who has a name with a Z? Like barely anyone. But he says, Zeta. And she goes, I like you. Right? I'm sitting next to him. I'm like, oh, like I can't believe he just did that. Like, wow, like, who does that? And she turns around to him, and she says, I don't like you. I like him. <laughs> no, I did not wake up. <laughs> My mom woke me up. No, I'm teasing. No. This is a true story. I promise. It is so true. I'll bring you historians to prove that this is true. <laughs> she liked me. She wanted a relationship with me. I'm not the coolest kid in the class. I was so shocked. I was just like, ah. <laughs> like, like, I didn't know what to do in that moment. Oh, my gosh, I could not believe it. But God reminded me that that's kind of like, when God says, I want relationship with you, I don't like him, I like you. I like you. I want you. H how much do you want me? I want you so much that I'll send my son to die on the cross for you. Like, I, I love you that much. I want you. I want you. I mean, how powerful is that? That the God of the universe wants us, wants me. There's billions of me. There's so many of me, but yet he wants me. He wants you. Ah, oh, I wish you knew him. I wish you knew him. You know, he is God. He is fully man, but, but more than that, he's a savior that wants an intimate relationship with you. He wants an intimate relationship with each and every one of us. So who is Jesus? Of all the things that you can say about Jesus, I hope the one thing that you can say today is that he's my savior. That he's the one that has rescued me from the literal pit of hell. That he has heard my cry, that he loves me and I love him forever. And one day, I won't just talk about him. I won't just uh, talk from here uh, where there's this distance between us, but, but I will be able to see him face to face and I'll be with him forever and ever and ever. And someone said, well, Forever and ever seems like a long time. Yes, it is a long time. Because it's about a loving, intimate relationship with an eternal God. By the way, have you ever woken up in the morning and said, I wish I was dead? Maybe you did, but you're probably not living a good life if you've said that. We don't ever, we really don't want this life to end. We do want to live forever. And, and that in itself is great. But to think that we will live forever in the presence of Almighty God is even greater. And today my hope is that you would be able to say, He's my Lord. He's my Savior. I'll tell you what, I made that decision a very long time ago, and it was literally the best decision I've ever made in my life. And those that have made that decision along with me will tell you the same thing. 
It is the best decision I've ever made in my life. Does it mean that life is absolutely perfect now? No. Does it mean that there are no more trials anymore? No. So why is it the best decision? Because you know what? Now in the midst of the trial, I have a God that goes with me in the trial. Now in the storm, I have a God that is with me in the storm. And let me tell you, that's how we're being perfected and that's how we're growing. I want you to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you don't, I want today to be the day where you confess him as Lord. Let's pray.